Um, yeah, so, and we can talk more about some of these problems too after, well, I'll give the, get everybody started on the, on the IR side of things too, but then we can spend time doing some more um, questions on here. So if you look at the way the priority would be to begin with, your highest priority is going to be, oh, I can't comment on this one because it's, um, your highest priority is going to be the bromine. And then it's going to be the carbon that goes towards the oxygen. And then it's going to be the methyl. And then the hydrogen is already pointed away from us is number four. When you go the other side, the R and the S, R and S may or may not switch because even though we switched where the hydrogen's pointing so that now we have the hydrogen pointing out towards us as number four, carbon then a nitrogen versus carbon and then an oxygen, all of a sudden this is your number one priority because oxygen's a higher atomic number than nitrogen is. So you replaced your number one priority with what becomes your number two in terms of priority. So that it's the it definitely still goes through that umbrella flip, but as to whether it switches from being S to being R, or it's from it's R initially, right? Now over here, the methyl is still three, but the the carbon that heads towards the oxygen is number one, and so you would get it would still be R. even though you wound up with it going through that umbrella flip where, where it inverted, it doesn't, so it, if it, you, to answer the question, inversion of configuration, we have to look at whether that means switching from R to S or does that just mean that everything goes through that, that umbrella flip? Um, because I could argue that either way, just looking at the, the words. I So what we want to double check that in the textbook when they say inversion of, con, I think configuration is specifically referring to R versus S. So even though it goes through the umbrella flip, it doesn't have a configuration inversion because it still winds up as R on the other side. Are you sure that's R? So or the... Like, because the hydrogen's pointing towards us. And so if we drew our arrow here, it would be going counterclockwise. But then we would need to turn around and look at it from the other side. We need to step through and turn around because the, the hydrogen is sticking towards us now. So wouldn't that be counterclockwise? And wouldn't that be S? It's counterclockwise when we look at it backwards. So then we have to flip it. Okay, but, oh, so, I mean, I did my, like, fan rotation on it, so mm -hmm. that my um, four group would be away from us, and I made, I mean, it, to me, it looks like S configuration. I guess I'm just... Let's, let's see. So, if we keep, let's keep the priority one where it is. Mm -hmm. Then that means that the to put the hydrogen where the cyanide is, then the cyanide would go down here. The methyl would be coming out towards us. And then the hydrogen is in the back. So one, two, three. Okay. Okay, then I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing something wrong. Um, yeah, and we can take, we'll take a look, I can take a look specifically at what you have drawn if you're not seeing it okay. on, on what you did and we can figure it out or if you can, it might just be one of those cases where if you start with a blank piece of paper, you can get the right answer. You, you know, you made two, two errors somewhere that cancel each other out or you're not seeing something that way. Um, I don't know if this is the same thing that you're running into, but I've had trouble trying to get the 
when I'm trying to assign R versus S, if I take the molecule and I try to look at it, like I'm just looking at the one tetrahedral carbon, that's where I get tripped up. Um, if I look at the molecule and then kind of do the arrow thing that way, it's a little bit easier for me, but I don't know if that happened to you or not. Fair, fair enough, I'll, I'll keep that in mind because everybody, everybody visualizes these things a little bit differently. And this is my first time ever teaching it totally remotely. So where I can't like hold up my hands and have you guys see them in 3D. Um, and so it's a little different for me. So I don't know exactly what, what works and what doesn't. Although there is a good UCLA website that has a bunch of practice problems for these as well that we used last year. Um, that I'll remember to put the link for that in. Um, uh, I'll send put that in an announcement later today. It's just got a, a bunch of practice that kind of that that uh, gamifies it. Is the pedagogic is the actual legitimate pedag pedagogy term is gamification, where you take a concept and you make a video game out of it um, to um, to help with learning comprehension. Um, and this website from UCLA does that where it basically it times you. How long does it take you to get it? And then do you get it right? If you get it wrong, you get no points and it's got a timer on it. It's kind of kind of fun. Um, it tells you what the molecules actually are because they're all and they're all um, different pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. So, but for now, let's go ahead and start talking about the IR spectroscopy. And I I have, like I said, a little mini mini lecture that um, just to sort of supplement this, this is one, um, one of those um, instrumental techniques, like I mentioned, like GC, where the, the actual process of getting the data is actually pretty boring. It's, it's a matter of taking the, there you go. There's the link for you, srschemistry.com. Um, th the actual getting the data from for is basically you take a drop of your sample or a, if it's a solid, you take a little tiny piece of it and you put it on a glass, it's not actually glass, but you put it on a pane um, that uh, doesn't absorb in the IR region at all. And then you bounce IR light of varying frequencies through it and you see what's absorbed and what's not. Um, and so that it's almost entirely done with the computer. The only thing you would physically be doing would be taking the drop of liquid and putting it on the paint, the, the um, sample pane. Um, and I do have some figures of what they actually physically look like. Which one had it? I think Gilbert had a good one. Um, And so the, the sample panes can look like a, there's a number of them that they basically take these little windows that are made out of um, usually a, a potassium bromide because it's super insoluble in anything organic. Um, and it also doesn't absorb in the IR in infrared re region at all. Um, and you basically just put a sample in between these two pieces and you sandwich it together and then you screw this whole thing together and then you, you get it an assembled thing that looks like this and you just bounce the IR light through this. And so you have a, it's, it's a lot like those, remember measuring absorption when you did equilibrium last year and you looked at how colored, how strong the color was to determine what the concentration was. Does that sound familiar? Um, and you had like, you know, had to have a calibration curve and then you had like, usually it's like a red or a purple depending on what lab you're doing. And the more intense the color, the more concentrated the sample. Um, it the apparatus looks a lot like that. It was those big beige boxes. Um, and the more common ones even just are even simpler. They're just called a FTIR, stands for Fourier transform, which means you literally don't even need to put bounce the light through it. You bounce the light off of it and look at the reflected light. Um, and there, so those are really easy to use. Um, and what it's, what we actually wind up measuring, the reason this is helpful and why we teach it in OCHEM is because different kinds of chemical bonds will actually absorb different wavelengths of light. So the same way when we were looking at 
when you're first learning about orbitals and and laser, or we looked at absorption and emission, and we looked at hydrogen. We did that lab last last fall where we had to you know use the meter sticks and that little that little lens that you had to look through to see the different colors of light and measure how far they were on the meter stick. Um, we were looking at an electronic transition in that case, where we were promoting the electrons using electricity and voltage and then letting them fall back down to a lower energy orbital, and that gives off light. Um, infrared spectroscopy, instead of looking at electronic transitions going from one orbital to another, we're looking at vibrational transitions. Um, and so these vibrations are basically, you can treat most all chemical bonds like they're basically springs that are attaching two weights together. Um, and so the, the strength of the spring, the, the stiffness of the spring, will determine how, what the frequency is that those two things vibrate at. If you think about a really, really soft slinky and holding it up at the top, and then it goes up and down slowly, versus if it was a much, you know, even just like a, a ballpoint pen, um, spring if you pull it down and let it go it vibrates back and forth really really fast right so the strength of the spring actually is going to have a different frequency depending on how big the weights are on either side and how strong the bond is between the two atoms and so that's actually what we're going to measure with ir is mostly we're looking at stretching vibrations because if the right wavelength of light, if the right frequency of light hits those bonds, it'll make the atoms vibrate back and forth faster. Which is why, which is why light can make things warmer, is basically what we're doing is you're shining light of a frequency that, and then when that light is absorbed, it turns that light into vibration of the atoms. So with what IR spectroscopy, what infrared spectroscopy is doing is measuring what the different frequencies are of light that we shine on it, and then how much of the light is absorbed versus how much of it passes through. So that allows us to basically to look at um, what the difference in energy is between these different states when it's vibrating. And the smaller the distance, the smaller the energy gap, the smaller the frequency is of light that would be absorbed. Where did you guys go? There you are. Um, and so what, what that winds up looking like is we get data that looks like this. And really all this, all the instrument is doing is it just goes through and scans through a whole big range of, of frequencies. And it says, okay, I'm gonna look at 400. Um, these are called wave numbers. They're proportional to um, Hertz in frequency. So this is, okay, I'm gonna look at 400 wave numbers and see how much it absorbs. And then it goes, I'm gonna look at 408 and see how much it absorbs. And then 412 and see how much it absorbs. And it just scans through the entire UV range to see, and it looks at, okay, at this particular wavelength, at this particular frequency, it absorbs a lot of the light. And so the percent transmittance is really low because almost all of the light is being absorbed. And the fact that it absorbs really strongly at this particular frequency tells us what types of bonds might be in the compound. Right, so all the different, every different functional group, every different kind of bond has a different, they call it characteristic frequency, where you are like, if that bond is in your molecule, then you're going to see a peak we call it a peak, even though they're pointed downward here, you would see a peak at approximately that frequency of light. So that, that actually gives us a ton of information about these molecules. Maybe not enough to actually get the entire structure, but it allows us to say things like, oh, if I've got a peak that's at 3,400 3, wave numbers, that's indicative of an OH bond. 
So I probably have an OH group in this molecule. If I have a, a peak at 3000, that's indicative of a carbon hydrogen bond. So I probably have carbon hydrogen bonds. If I have something down here around 1500, that, that's characteristic of a carbonyl, of a carbon oxygen bond. Right, so that it basically gives us, a, we're going to get a laundry list of potential functional groups that might be in our molecules, which are sort of pieces of a puzzle. If you think about trying to do a jigsaw puzzle where you don't know, you don't know what it's supposed to look like, you just have a bunch of pieces in front of you. If I just ask you what what the picture is of you may or may not be able to tell but if you start to be able to say oh i can look at this piece over here these four pieces when i put them together it starts looking a lot like um you know a steering wheel so maybe this is a car that's in this drawing this in and you start to be able to put together these different pieces of evidence and sort of make a case for it's this type of molecule or this is a potential structure of this molecule Right, so that's the goal for IR spectroscopy is just get a list of functional groups that are probably in your compound. Um, and the way you do it, there's the most important groups. Um, I'm going to go over with you guys and give you an example of how we can read these. Um, because, and, and read is the wrong word, interpret is the better word because you're not reading this like it's a set thing that you know, you kind of okay, how do I, it's like translating from another language um, and using the right idioms and stuff like that. It's more of an art sometimes. I, I won't say it's more than a, of an art than a science because this is literally a science. Um, but it, it, there is some wiggle room and there's more of a, okay, I have to use some interpret or some judgment, some intuition that you develop with practice. Um, in general, we can break these things up into these different regions. Anything that's above about 20, 2600 wave numbers is going to be something it bonded to a hydrogen. Anything that's any double bonds that you have are going to show up in this region from about 1600 to 1800. Any triple bonds you have are a little bit higher in frequency because they're stronger bonds. So triple bonds show up more in this 2000 to 2200 range. And then a lot of these single bonds where you have larger atoms on both sides are actually really hard to interpret because you get down, there's, turns out there's lots of different kinds of vibrations that can happen. And you wind up with these things all sort of overlapping with each other and it gets really hard to tell what's what. Um, anything below 1500 or so, we call the fingerprint region because every compound is gonna have a unique fingerprint region that's, that you can actually scan through a database, like, like a, an old CSI episode with somebody's fingerprint. And it just scans through the entire database of everybody who's ever you know, had a finger. Um, you can do that with these fingerprint regions, although you have to have a really good sample and know that it's really pure or else you might, it might not match right. But for the most part, there's not a lot we can interpret down in the fingerprint region. So for the most part, once you get below 1500, we still have data for it, but we kind of ignore it. We don't try to interpret it too much. We're mostly gonna be looking at this region from 1500 to about 3500. Um, and so this is a fairly, fairly typical way of presenting this information. Um, it's not as easy to look at, um, but in, but basically you can go through, this is listed by functional group as opposed to by frequency, but it can, it can tell you, okay, if I look, if you look in that 3200 to 3600 range that, and you have a peak, that's probably an alcohol. If you have something that goes, that's got a big broad peak from, 2200 all the way up to 3600 that's probably a carboxylic acid right so this is just arranged a little bit differently instead of spatially it's arranged by functional group um, and it's 
you can basically treat this as a checklist. You can go down these tables and say, okay, do I have that? No, cross it off. Do I have it? Yes, put a check mark. That, that's probably a functional group I need to consider. Or uh, maybe there's three or four different options. If you look at the carbonyls over here, all of these carbonyls show up between about 1650 and 1850, which is a pretty small range here. That would be between, so 1650 to 1850, like all of those different functional groups all show up in about the same place. And so a lot of times you can't necessarily tell which of these you have, but you can tell you've got one of them. So you can tell you about a carbonyl, you just don't know exactly what type of carbonyl it is. Is it an ester or is it a ketone or is it an aldehyde without more information? Right, so this is a lot of information. It's not everything you need to get the structure right though. So if you feel like there's still a lot of possibilities when you start looking at these, there are. And it's about getting close to the right structure, not necessarily getting everything. This is another um, figure that has it arranged spatially as well. Um, that uh, is from Compound Interest, is that, um, that chemistry blog that makes all these figures that look kind of like this. They have a lot of good resources for OCHEM. Um, this has a lot of stuff that we're not going to get into yet. We haven't even talked about what a nitro compound is yet. Um, but it's really a good way of, if you have a spectrum and you want to know what things might show up, like, oh, I've got peaks from 2600 to 2800, what could that be? Okay, well, that could be part of a carboxylic acid. Maybe it's part of an aldehyde. It just allows you to, to arrange it like, and kind of, you can almost overlay this on top of your spectrum and use this to judge, okay, what functional groups might be there. Um, and the one that I give you guys on the, I put a link to on the assignment. Also, sorry about the the uh, false announcement earlier. Uh, that's what happens when I have more than one Cam Canvas page open at the same time. Um, you guys got the, you guys would have been really, really confused if I didn't catch that because it would have been, what does he mean, tin for chloride? We're not naming things with tin in them. Um, if you look at the assignments and look at lab seven, um, I have a more streamlined, less detailed version. That has, no, oh, it looks like it printed my comments in there as well. Oh, well. I'll have to fix those. Um, and basically, as it grouped by type of bond. So, and again, this is kind of a good way to sort of zero in on what you're looking at. Um, but it's really hard for me, for you guys to really wrap your head around what's going on here just by me telling you. So, let's go through one of these and I'll, I'll interpret it the way that I and um, the way that I would normally go about this. Um, and so if we just look at this, let me get rid of this thing and make this bigger. Um, if we just are given this spectrum, and we don't know anything about the compound whatsoever. Usually you will know at least something like the molecular formula, like there's you know, seven carbons and two oxygens or something like that. Even if you know nothing about this, there are some clues in here that we can look at. Um, and the, the most obvious is usually, is there an OH group? OH groups are really polar, right? An oxygen attached to a hydrogen, you've got a really big difference in electronegativity, really strong intermolecular forces, which means that the peaks are actually really broad, meaning literally wide. And so when you look at this here, if you, if you start with saying, well, that one doesn't look like the rest of these, 
this peak here is wider than the rest. If you go and check your list of characteristic frequencies, which, again, let me pull that up. Um, just and now I'm going to use the one that I um, that I made just because this is, looks a lot more standard than the compound interest one. Anything that shows up above 3,200, it's usually going to be an OH or an NH group. There's only a few things that show up all the way up there, and OH groups in particular. If you're a liquid or a solid, we refer to them as H bonded because we have a lot of strong forces in between those molecules that makes the peak wide, makes the peak broad when you have those intermolecular forces. So this peak right here, the shape of it and the fact that it's all the way up at 3400 tells me right off the bat there's an OH group, 100%. There's no question about it that this is an OH group. NHs show up a little bit higher in energy and are sharper because the hydrogen bonds are not as strong. So the way I would interpret this is I would go through and I would, if I ever print it out, I would just circle it and say, okay, that's definitely an OH group. I don't know what else there is, but I know there's an OH. And then going from left to right, the next really important piece of information happens right at 3,000 wave numbers. If I go back to that list of frequencies, right at 3,000 is where you had all the carbon-hydrogen bonds. And the carbon-hydrogen bonds, if you look at all of these here, the only ones that show up below 3,000 are sp3 carbon hydrogen bonds. So if you have bond, if you have peaks that are below 3,000, but right around 3,000, these, at least these ones, and probably all three of those are sp3. carbon hydrogen bonds. And the fact that there's nothing between the OH group and the and 3000, there are no none of these little sharp peaks that are all clustered together. There's none of those above 3000. And th this is the other key is that the absence of a peak is really important too because this specifically tells us there are no sp2 or sp carbon hydrogen bonds because if there were sp2 carbon hydrogen bonds or sp carbon hydrogen bonds there would be something right right above 3000 the fact that there's not is just as important as the fact as the peaks that are there and so first two key points, look for OH groups. They're going to be easy to recognize because they're really distinctive looking. And if it was a carboxylic acid, carboxylic acids are even easier to recognize because they actually go all the way from like 2200 up to 3600. So if it was carboxylic acid, we'd have something that looked like that. So Big, broad peaks are OH groups. This is an alcohol OH, not a carboxylic acid OH, because it's not wide enough to be a carboxylic acid. Second thing you look for is, are, do I have sp2 carbon hydrogen bonds or sp3 carbon hydrogen bonds, or both? In this case, we don't have any sp2. It doesn't mean you don't have any sp2 carbons, just that none of the sp2 carbons have hydrogens attached to them. You guys see the, the subtle difference there? Usually you can also use that to say, well, there's probably no sp2 carbons 
but it's not definitive on its own. It just means that if you have sp2 carbons, there's no hydrogens on them. And then the last major category that you should look for is in that 1650 to 1850 range. In this range here, if there's a carbonyl, there should be something sharp and pretty strong. So like there's a little peak there, but that's probably either impurity or noise. If it's a carbonyl, it would be pretty strong and very sharp as well. So narrow, not broad. So the fact that there is not a big strong peak there tells me I probably, not only do I not have any sp2 carbon hydrogens, I also don't have any carbon oxygen double bonds. Now, I made these slides a year ago, um, and I pulled this, I didn't make the spectrum myself, I pulled this from one of the textbooks. So I don't even actually know anything about this compound other than the stuff that we just worked through. Just by looking at this, without knowing the formula, or anything else, I know it's got sp3 carbon hydrogens, it doesn't have a carbonyl, and it does have an OH group. If my memory can be trusted, and that's a big if on this one, this is, I think that this is like isopropyl alcohol. It's a relatively small molecule that's all, that's saturated that has an OH group. This doesn't give me the information to actually be able to tell you what the formula is or how many carbons are in a row or anything else. Two butanol, thank you, Adam. So not isopropyl alcohol, one, one extra carbon on there. Um, which means, Adam, did this come from, from the uh, Klein textbook or from something uh, else? Yeah, I mean, it's the exact same one that I'm looking at. So then I, I have a digital copy of the Klein textbook. So when I was making the slides, I just probably screen screen grabbed it. So it's probably yeah. what it is. I mean, technically it's a database, right? They should all look the same wherever you get them. They're going to look, uh, the, the actual, no. res, the resolution will look a little different and just like random stuff, like the color. If you look at the ones from the, for the actual lab today. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I try to source them when I can, um, but this, you know, so, but it does, it looks, they look pretty much the same no matter where you get them. Um, and a lot of them too, if you were actually taking this, the data yourself, a lot of times what you can do with the software is you just go through after you got this and it gives you the opportunity to do something like, um, they, they call it a peak picking. You go through and you click on the individual peaks and allow in that, and it'll actually measure. Okay, that was measured at this wavelength. So instead of having to like look down here and measure it yourself, you can actually just look at it, and and it just would say spit out thirty five oh two or something like that. Um, so it's a little bit harder. You guys not doing this yourself, um, but it's the same basic principles, and you don't need to get that specific be accurate. In fact, getting that accurate sometimes can be a, a detriment because it allow, sometimes it's a bit of a red herring. If you look at some of these IR frequencies for the carbonyl groups, especially esters versus aldehydes versus ketones, all those ranges overlap with each other. And so if you actually have, have a spectrum that has the, that carbonyl peak directly labeled, it can make you think it's an aldehyde when really it's an ester because they're overlapping with each other. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something where if you do have a really good pure sample and you take a scan of it, you can either just match it up um, or there's software that will actually go through a database and look at these different peaks and say, okay, peak at these six different wavelengths, that's definitely, you know, phenol or 2-butanol or whatever it is. Right, so that's the primary data interpretation and analysis that you guys are going to have to do for this. 
and actually I just stopped my screen share, but then I'm going to go back to it in just a second. Um, And again, these are the key details. And I'll post these slides as soon as I get them saved and, and uploaded. And when we're done here, look for the CH peaks near 3000. Look for the big broad peaks above 3000. The, and the, the OH groups, you're usually going to see um, something centered around 3200, 3400 that's going to be really noticeably wider than everything else. The only time they show up is really narrow is called out in the in here as being free if you have a free alcohol that means gas phase because if it's in the gas phase there's no hydrogen bonding that happens it's the hydrogen bonding that makes it that wide shape that rounded shape um you almost never see these unless you're just looking through databases online unless you have really specific specialized um setup so you can almost always rely on OHs or wide. Look at that, that 3000 number is really key for, is it SP2, SP or SP3, carbon hydrogen bonds and aldehydes. These other three functional groups down here, aldehydes, alkynes and nitriles all have fairly, dis, fairly dead giveaway um, characteristics. For instance, aldehydes show up um aldehydes have a carbon hydrogen bond that's sp2 but because of that oxygen on there it doesn't show up with the other sp2 carbon hydrogens it shows up between 2700 and 2900 so lower than the sp3 carbons but above all of the carbonyls so if you have a peak and we can see it like right here there's your aldehyde if you have a strong peak right in this region it's not that doesn't match up with your alkanes and it doesn't match up with your other stuff it's probably an aldehyde there's not much else that shows up in that same range and same with nitriles and alkynes triple bonds absorb at a very specific frequency too so carbon carbon triple bonds carbon nitrogen triple bonds show up all by themselves nothing else around them right so those are really easy things to recognize when you start getting in the fingerprint region, like don't try to interpret it too much. Don't go looking for stuff in there because it's a little bit, it's a little bit like trying to trying to read a prophecy after the fact. Like, you know, if the prophecy is vague enough, you can make it seem like whatever you want it to seem, right? It's like fortune cookie. That's better better example. Um, a fortune cookie means whatever you want it to mean when you read it, right? Like it always seems like it applies to you because it's just really vague. That's the fingerprint region. If you think you know what you're looking for in the fingerprint region, you can always find it. It doesn't mean it's really there. It just means that there's enough peaks, you'll see something. Right, so don't go in there without really good reason or without a lot more experience. Don't mess with the fingerprint region. More trouble than it's worth. It be how we categorize it. Um, so the, but your three big checkpoints, carbon hydrogen bonds, oxygen hydrogen bonds, and carbonyls are the groups to look for. And you'd be surprised how much information that coupled with the molecular formula will get you pretty close to at least, it'll, it'll narrow it down to about five potential structures more often than not. You won't be able to decide between those five, but that's a lot fewer than you started with if you just have the molecular formula, right? If it's C7H12O2, you know, there are so many different ways you can combine that. There's hundreds of ways you could combine that. To be able to narrow it down just to five is pretty good. And then we'll bring in other instruments and how they'll allow us to actually finalize what's, what is the likely structure down the road here. All right, discard the ink notations. Um, let me look at, so the assignment itself, 
um, gives you a procedure for a process called steam distillation um, that I have a few, there's um, a couple good videos down here that I didn't try to make my own video because this guy did a really good job of making these videos about steam distillation. Um, and this is the exact same lab. This is a very standard lab. This clove oil is isolating clove oil from raw cloves. You take cloves, you grind them up, you do a steam distillation, um, which is like a regular distillation, except the whole idea with the steam distillation is, Oh. Um, if you do a steam distillation, a regular distillation, the point is to separate two things that have a really different boiling point, right? We're almost doing the opposite here. We're using the fact that you can, that if you put water, say, with something that has a much higher um, vaporization point, you actually get a mixture of both of the compounds. So if we look at, at um, water and bromobenzene versus a mixture of the two. If you put water and bromobenzene together and do a distillation, anything that comes out the other end is gonna be a mixture of water and bromobenzene, right? Even if it's mostly water, it's gonna be able to have a little bromobenzene in there. Well, if you have something that normally boils at 300 Celsius or 500 Celsius, you can't really do a distillation with that, especially if it's a natural material, because if you, what would happen if you, so 500 Celsius is like a thousand Fahrenheit. What would happen if you took plant matter and tried to do a distillation of the essential oil up at a thousand Fahrenheit? You just destroy whatever you're working with. You just destroy everything. Everything just turns to black charcoal, right? So the idea with the steam distillation is you're gonna get mostly water, that comes across and you collect if you have water and your sample mixed together, but it's gonna bring with it a little bit of something that has a higher boiling point. And so if you capture 100 milliliters of distillate, you might get one milliliter of, of essential oil along with it. So a steam distillation is set up the same way, except it's almost the opposite purpose. We wanna get a mixture of water and our organic stuff. Um, and there's a lot of math you can do to predict what the different compounds would be. Um, where's my, the other one, where's Pavia? Does not have a, it does not. Um, This is why I love having digital versions of this. Steam distillation. You have to be able to spell properly though. In the techniques, of course. So steam distillation. So steam distillation is super useful. Um, and this has this one has some different figures. Um, they say, okay, you're going to get some mixture of the two components. The apparatus winds up being very, very similar to what we did for regular distillation. Um, the only difference is we put, if we're doing this lab in real life, we take our cloves, we grind them up, we put that clove powder, the ground clove down here in the bottom with a bunch of water. And we just keep adding water to keep it at about half full. And then when we heat it and boil it, we capture the vapor over here like a regular distillation, except that's gonna be, bring with it a tiny amount of anything that's organic, that's vol it's anything that's volatile, meaning that it can be in the vapor phase, is gonna come with the water when it evaporates. Adding the water allows us to keep it at a lower temperature so we can get that stuff to evaporate a little bit at a time without bringing it up to 1,000 Celsius or 1,000 Fahrenheit. Right. And so then what we collect at the bottom is going to be mostly water with a little bit of our organic compound mixed in. And so that is actually what they call an essential oil. The essential oil 
com comes from the Latin word definition of the word essential, which means it's the piece that has the essence of a specific plant. So the essential oil of cloves is going to be a mixture of compounds. It's mostly this compound called eugenol. Um, that smell is what gives cloves its taste and its smell. The essential oil of lemon is the same thing. It's, it's a compound called limonene. Um, if you get the essential oil of pepper, um, it actually has a common name. It's known as mace. Mace is called pepper spray because it's literally the essential oil of black pepper put into an aerosol form. Um, so these are really, this is a really common method. It's been around for a really long time. And this is how almost all essential oils are actually extracted from the plants. Um, you can do this with anything that has an essential oil, lavender, cinnamon, stuff like that. Um, cloves and limonene are usually picked for this lab because lemon, essential oil of lemon and essential oil of cloves are really just one compound. For a lot of the others, it's a mixture of other stuff. Mace is mixed in with other things, which is why black pepper tastes different than pink pepper, and which tastes different than white pepper. Um, those other trace ingredients are gonna, would basically get in the way if we were trying to look at just a single compound at a time. So we use clove and clove, lemon, and cinnamon are the most common examples. Um, other ones that we've done before. Last year, I had them do this lab where I didn't tell them what the compounds were, and we used lemongrass and star anise, and where's some other ones? What is star anise? Star anise is, um, it smells a lot like black licorice, um, but it's, it's a, component, it's got similar compounds. Five spice, Chinese five spice is one plant that actually has a whole bunch of different essential oil compounds, which makes it taste like it's a mixture of spices when really it's one compound. Star anise is similar. It's mostly one compound and it's also, that compound is in five spice. Um, Anyway, so that was just to give you a little bit of an intro as to what the procedure would look like. Um, and then there's another video on steam distillation as well that goes through some what the actual procedure would look like, how you would set it up. It's not that long and will help you answer for a couple of the practical analysis questions. Um, and also I will pull the sections from these textbooks on steam distillation out and I'll put those with the assignment as well. So you can have these if you'd rather read through these than, um, than watch a video or if the video doesn't explain it well enough or in depth enough for you. Um, I'll post those as well. But then, so that's, that's gonna be your lab this week is read about steam distillation and then interpret the data that we would get from steam distillation, which would be the IR spectra. So any, any questions so far? You haven't run into really any roadblocks yet, so it's, I know it's hard for you guys to come up with questions until you start trying it. Um, when it comes to this section here, draw two possible isomers based on the IR spectrum and the molecular formulas, I'm not looking for you to get the right structure. I don't want you to go look up what the structure of eugenol is and just write the correct structure because then I'll know that you did that because you, there's no way you can get to absolutely the right structure just based on the ion. What I'm looking for on your possible structures are, do, do the structures that you draw have the right molecular formula that matches what I give you? And is it consistent with the data from the ion? Does it have an OH group or not? Does it have sp3 carbons or not? Right, I don't, I'm not looking for the right answer there. So don't feel overwhelmed. Just give me something that meets, matches the criteria that you've seen, okay? That's usually what I've, I've found that to be the biggest roadblock for you guys. When you get to that part, there are so many possibilities. How can I possibly know which one's right? You're not supposed to know that yet. We'll get there. 
All right, then I will turn you guys loose on this. Um, this second video here also has a little bit of the characterization part, meaning looking at the IR for clove oil. Um, and so if you're trying to, your spectrum doesn't look anything like his, but if you're trying to figure out, okay, what are the different peaks? How would I label them? What's, what's an OH group and what's not? That kind of stuff it could be really helpful to look through that. It won't help you on the limonene one because he only is looking at clove oil. Um, and try to do it without just looking up the structures first, as though you didn't know what their names were. Um, because if you ever got into a case where you didn't know what the name of the compound was, that's the way you would have to approach it. A little bit at a time, start eliminating stuff. All right, now I really will stop talking. <laughs>